Okay, Bezat right. Hashem. Page Adaf 157 and uh, completing Masechet Shabbat. Uh, we are discussing the Machloket um, between the Biuda and the Shimon regarding Mukset, Machloket that we saw runs throughout the Masechet. And here we get uh, some closure about it. Uh, we had a Mishnah that uh, mentioned them. And then we went through a few different uh, Muraim, and they, uh, some say halacha like uh, this, and some say halacha like that. Uh, Rab was Machmir, Shemuel is Mekel, he said halacha kerebi Shimon. Um, and then we were up to Rabbi Yohanan. He says, Rabbi Yohanan amar halacha kerebi Shimon, who does not, um, uh, who holds, who says mukse only in minimal cases. Uh, he's lenient about it. We have Rabbi Yochanan Hachi, we have Rabbi Yochanan Hachi Stam Mishnah. Wait a second, is it possible that Rabbi Yochanan really was lenient regarding Mukse like Rabbi Shimon? We know that he's the author of the principle Halacha Kistam Mishnah. That's by the way very interesting just by itself because we kind of take it for granted across the board. Halacha Kistam Mishnah, it's one of the main basic principles of, of uh, halachic uh, adjudication. Uh, but when you look, Rabbi Yochanan is, uh, is an early Amora, you know, one of the first generation, maybe he lived a long time, so into second generation. But he's the one that codified that rule. In other words, that rule was not necessarily obvious uh, as soon as Rabbi Yudanasi published the Mishnah, it's Rabbi Yochanan that uh, makes the rule, and you see it's still quoted in his name. So maybe there were other people that did not assume that that was true. Okay, but since Rabbi Yochanan is the originator um, and, uh, of that rule, so he also has to say, if we find a anonymous, an anonymous Mishnah, then, then, the Mish, then Halakha has to follow that, 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 that opinion. And yet, we find an anonymous Mishnah that is uh, stringent regarding Hukhot Mukseh. Utnan and Nevakya'in Aisim min HaKorot. Since here that you're not allowed to chop wood from beams or beam that broke on Yom Tov. Uh, in other words, even though on Yom Tov you're allowed to, if you have firewood set aside, you can chop the firewood and put it into the, into the fire because you're allowed to burn a fire on Yom Tov. But if it's not set aside, it's meant as a beam or it actually was a beam of your house that broke and it's not permitted. And so you see here that there is a concept of mukseh, and this seems to follow, this Mishnah in Masechet Besa seems to follow Rabbi Yehuda. So which one is it? Rabbi Yochanan Ahuke Rabbi Yoseh Bar Yehuda Matnila. Oh, when Rabbi Yochanan taught that Mishnah in Besa, he taught it in the name of Rabbi Yoseh Bar Yehuda, who was lenient in this regard. And so actually, although it looks to us like a Sam Mishnah, uh, in fact, Rabbi Yochanan did not think it was a Stam Mishnah. He thought that was opinion of a minority. So now we held up the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the thesis that Rabbi Yochanan says, Halacha Rabbi Shimon. Tashema matchilin barimat ha-teben. Avalo be'asim sheba muksem. If you want to go get some straw, you can get some, some from the pile of straw uh, to, to burn. But there's wood that's in a mukse. This word mukse is actually a, a noun, a name of a place. It's a storage uh, uh, area. Uh, it would be behind the house. It would be for long-term storage, things that you don't mean to use for months. Uh, so here, this, uh, this statement says you're not allowed to use uh, the wood over there. So that looks like there is, he does have a concept of mukse. And this is a stam mishnah. Uh, no, there is talking about uh, cedar and fir trees that are going to be used for building. People don't usually burn them, and so they, that's a different category. Um, it's not it's uh, right? That's a category of things that are expensive or things that you only use for a particular purpose. You know, like a big saw or you know some special tool or item. Uh, so therefore, these things people are very careful with. And even Rabbi Shimon, who does not hold the mukse in general, agrees that mukse mechamat chesron kis. And this fits into that. I feel Rabbi Shimon mode. Okay, so we could resolve that um, uh, source. Another Mishnah, however, we're going to use to question Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yochanan. See, although we're questioning Rabbi Yochanan, this is also an exercise in going through the Mishnah 
because Mishnah doesn't say anywhere explicitly that you know this the whole Mishnah follows one or the other. So you know we're trying to find a common denominator, and the Mishnah is not always so consistent. So we're just we're using Rabbi Yochanan's opinion in order to explore this. Tashema en mashkin shochatin tamid bariot, but mashkin shochatin tabayatot. Uh, if you want to go and uh, uh, slaughter an animal on Yom Tov, which in general is allowed, uh, you can take one from a domesticated animal, one that's in uh, on your farm in the fence, but not one that's out, that's grazing out in the field, because that is set aside, right? That one is muksei. You don't even have in mind that you're gonna that you're gonna eat that one. Uh, so there you go. There is a concept of muksei. Right, and that's a stam mishnah. Hey, Rabbi Yochanan, what are you going to do with that? Rabbi Yochanan said, "Tama acharina ashkach." Rabbi Yochanan agrees. Yes, that is a stam mishnah, but there's another stam mishnah, um, and this one says, "Bet shama omri magbihin me'alash shulchan asamot uklipin." Or bet he lel omri meselek at tabla kula mina ara. Right, we saw this mishnah that if you uh, you know you're eating uh, uh, eating bizet and you have and you and you, the shells are uh, you're putting the shells on the on the table. Or whatever you know, scraps, bones um, that you put on the table, those are well, they could be mukse. So Bitchamai says that's okay. You just take them and you throw them out. You can touch them. It's okay. This is a, one case where Bitchamai is actually lenient. And Beth Bitchidel says no, you can't do that. Rather, you pick up the whole tray and then you uh, you just uh, shake them off the tray indirectly. So here, here according to this, Bitchidel does have mukse. However, Although this is the, the version of our Mishnah, um, we learn that the Amoraim switched the opinions. should be Mahmir, according to the Biuda, could be Shimon. Therefore, you might have to switch the opinions. Actually, Betilel that says it's okay, and you can take the bones and you can just pick them up and throw them out. And that is a Mishnah. And yet here in this Mishnah, Betilel, and Al Khafal is Betilel. Um, is, uh, is, is says it's allowed. So therefore, Rabbi Yochanan says, I know there's the Mishnah that way, but I have this Mishnah this way. And so, in other words, since there's a contradiction within the Mishnah corpus in the whole, um, Rabbi Yochanan's rule, Halachakistan Mishnah, cannot simply be applied, uh, but rather he has to choose between different authoritative Mishnayot, and he chooses to be lenient. Okay, now in general, you know, which categories of Muxeya does Rabbi Shimon think are uh, apply or don't apply? He says everywhere uh, uh, is Rabbi Shimon, except for Muxeya Mechamat Mi'us. In other words, although Rabbi Shimon might uh, be lenient, we are not lenient. Uh, something that's repulsive. Uh, oil lamp that's used up, and so then it has you know drippings all over and burnt, and you know it's uh, it's it's dirty. Uh, so um, that is not something that anybody would use for any any uh, productive purpose. So that's called mukse mechamat mius, and uh, so that's that we even if you follow bishimon, that you should stay away from that, not move it. Another opinion says. Even that, we followed Bishimon, and you can move it. Not the general one would usually think of something that is usually used for Yisur, like a hammer, but rather this like a, 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 a candle that was used on that very Shabbat. Let's say the Shabbat candles that you that you, you we lit uh, on Friday night. Even after they go out, you're not allowed to move them. Right? They have to stay there they, their entire Shabbat. And even if we follow, even although we follow the Bishimon in general, even if we follow the Bishimon in general, in this case, not. Um, but even this second opinion that's even more lenient said, still agrees that the Bishimon has some category of Mukse, and that's the one of an item that is a, is a, um, a expensive item, a, uh, a particular item that's used for a particular purpose that nobody would use for something else. And he must agree to this because of that foundational Mishnah that says anything, this is like, you know, wait, uh, the, the, the development of Mukseh uh, says anything can be used except for 
this large saw and the blade of a plow. Um, and so this, this, is, uh, this is a universal category that everybody agrees with. Okay, and so that's, uh, that's the end of the discussion of, uh, of Mukseh. Now, last Mishnah. Mifirin edarim ba-shabbat, v'nishalin edarim shehen l'sorech ha-shabbat. Okay, uh, so uh, this is, these are things that, these are some items that are not technically a melacha, they're not one of the 39, but they're things that, um, like, you don't go to court on, on Shabbat, they're different things that are considered obdin de hall, usually done during the week, but sometimes they're allowed on Shabbat. So, um, to undo a vow, if a daughter, right, uh, uh, and who's living under a father's house, or a wife, uh, makes a vow, right, Torah says that the, the father or the husband can, as soon as he hears the vow, can undo it, right? If she gets, you know, she gets angry and says, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, make dinner ever again, or, um, yeah, or I'm not going to, uh, you know, live at home, whatever. So, uh, so that since it's something that can disrupt the home, uh, so the father can, or, or the husband can, with, within a day, uh, can undo it. After the day passes, the Torah gives a limit and says, no, once if you heard about it and didn't say anything for a day, then the vow sticks. Uh, so since we, we're going to talk about this day uh, limit, what is it? Is it a 24-hour period? In other words, from, you know, from uh, 9 o'clock to 9 o'clock? Uh, or is it a, a, a calendar day? So that if it's, let's say, right before sunset, then it might only be a few minutes. Okay, that's what we're going to discuss in the, in the Gemara, which will make a difference because, you know, if the calendar the day is Shabbat, then Shabbat's the only day that you can undo the vow. So then you see why it might be necessary to do it. Okay, this is what we call Hatarat um, Nedarim. This is in front of a Betin, in front of three people, um, and you go and say, I vow, I made this vow, but, you know, I didn't realize the consequences. I'm sorry I made the vow, and so they can undo the vow. Um, so that you can do on Shabbat only if it's lesorech ha-Shabbat, if it's for the purpose of Shabbat. For some example, someone says, I'm not going to eat today. Well, that's no good because Shabbat, is supposed to have a meal. And so now he's, uh, he's, he's for, the, for the purpose of Shabbat, in order to help out Shabbat itself, uh, he, he can go and undo it. But if it has nothing to do with Shabbat, if it's just I'm not going to go fishing on Tuesday, then you can't undo that on Shabbat. You can undo that the next day. And one can seal a window. Uh, in other words, in a temporary, a temporary way, you're, you're, putting a, you're closing up a window. Uh, you don't want light to enter. We're going to see an example of you don't want tum'ah to enter. And you can also uh, measure a rag. A uh, rag, if it's very small, less than three by three finger breaths, then it's not a kabel tumah. It's not considered as any. It's not even considered a cloth. It's not a utensil at all. So if you want to uh, check to see how big it is, you're allowed to do a measurement. In general, measuring on Shabbat is not allowed. You know, people on like Weight Watchers, you want to measure how many ounces this food is. Right? This is all a problem. But if it's a measure, it's not a melacha. It's just that this is a uh, a week a weekday thing to do. Um, so if you're doing it for a purpose of a mitzvah, then you are allowed to measure. So uh, say you have some, a tub uh, somewhere, and you want to know, is this big enough to be a mikveh? So you can go and you can measure it, see how many amot it is, how much water does it hold. And sure enough, there was a case um, with these sages that they uh, closed up a, a, a window, a sealed up a window, using some kind of earthenware vessel. And they uh, tied an earthenware shard with a reed grass um, because they wanted to know the size of a hole. We're going to see what this case is. And since they did all these things, we can learn that for the purposes of a mitzvah, you need to determine some halachic uh, uh, status. You are allowed to close up and to measure and to make a knot, uh, a temporary knot on Shabbat. Okay, let's we'll see exactly what case they were talking about. The case there was a dead body in an alleyway and they needed to do this in order to contain the tumah of the body. 
All right, Ibaya Lehu. The question was asked, Hafara ben le sorech u ben shelo le sorech. U shela le sorech in, shelo le sorech la. U mishum hachi kami palge mehadade. O dilma hafara name le sorech in, shelo le sorech la. The question is, how do you read these first two um, statements of the Mishnah? Because the second one says, if it's for the purpose of Shabbat, in other words, if someone makes a vow, I'm not going to eat on Shabbat, you can undo that vow. Only if it's one that applies to Shabbat. Is that only for hatarat nedarim that you do in front of three, uh, three rabbis? Or is that also applied, does that limitation also apply to the husband undoing a vow of his daughter? Is that also only if it's lesorech Shabbat that he can undo it? Right? Or in any case. Well, now since there's two, they, it's mentioned as two separate clauses, right? So the first uh, option says, it's, uh, it does not apply. Hafarat uh, nedarim apply is uh, no matter what the vow is. And that would make some sense since, since um, in a way, it always, uh, you always need to do it on Shabbat if you say that it's a, it's a one day period, right? So then you only, have un, you only have Shabbat to undo it and you wouldn't be able to do it afterwards. So according to this reading, Afarat nedarim by a father is no matter what the case is, no matter what the subject matter is, and undoing it with a betin is only if it is, applies to something that she said, I'm not going to do or do on Shabbat. And that's why they're separated in two clauses. That's one way of reading the Mishnah. The other way of reading it is that, no, hafara also has to be a vow that, that affects her Shabbat. And uh, that's only why. And only in that case can the father or the husband undo it. And well, in that case, why is it separated into two clauses? Maybe separated because the process is different. The first case does not need a betin, it's just the father or the husband on their own. And the second one needs three people in order to be a betin to do it. And that has nothing to do with, uh, uh, with the case that it applies to. So that's the question. Let's try to answer it. Tashema. So there you go, right? It's uh, um, this uh, sage, uh, Zute, in the house of, uh, in the school of La Papa, said that it doesn't matter what the reason is that you can, the father can undo the vow, whether it apply, applies to something regarding Shabbat or whether it's about any other subject matter. Um, uh, sorry, the opposite. I don't know why I just said that. The Sorah Shabbat. You can undo vows that are apply for Shabbat. The Sorah Shabbat in Shelo. The Sorah Shabbat la. Right. The daughter said something. I'm not uh, said something else. Right? I'm not going to go fishing tomorrow. She cannot. He cannot do that. He cannot undo that. Okay. Lishana acharina. Ibaya. Okay. That's one. That's uh, one version of this whole question. The question and the answer. We have another version of this question and answer. It's pretty similar, but it adds a little bit more elaboration. Right? It has to be for the purpose of something that applies to Shabbat. Uh, does that apply to both types of vows? And you can never undo any vow if it's not doesn't apply to Shabbat. According to this, right, this would follow the opinion that the father can undo the vow within a 24-hour period. Because since it's within a 24-hour period, she makes the vow um, at uh, midnight on Friday night. Well, then he has till midnight Saturday night to undo it. So we can do it, undo it after Shabbat. Um, or the second option is whether it applies to Shabbat or not apply to Shabbat. And in this version, it would make more sense if it was a a calendar period. So since it's a calendar day, and that day is on Shabbat, because that's when she made the vow, so the father can only undo it on Shabbat. If he waits till after Shabbat, he won't be able to undo it at all. And therefore, since the, the, the time limit is Shabbat, so any vow that she makes, he is allowed to undo, even if it has nothing to do with Shabbat, because he won't have a, a chance to do it after Shabbat. So you see, this explicitly correlates these two issues. Okay, same answer, same sage. The Zute said, The father can undo something as for that applies to Shabbat. But if, her, if the content of her vow has nothing to do with her Shabbat observance, then he cannot undo it. 
And therefore, we prove that, in, according to this, according to him, that it's a 24-hour period. Because this assumes that there has to be some amount of time before Shabbat, after Shabbat, where he can, uh, it's not within, uh, not on Shabbat itself, uh, that's still within the 24-hour period, and he can undo it then. So then, uh, and, and that's, so, so, since you have a, a time period, this way till then. Okay. I said after. How about before? We have a Mishnah that says can be all day and it can be sometimes stringent and sometimes lenient. How so? Kisad. Nadra lele Shabbat, mefed lele Shabbat, beyoma Shabbat, ad she techshach. If someone one makes a vow on a Shabbat evening, then he can nullify that vow on Shabbat evening and the next day until dark. Right? In other words, on Friday night if she makes it. Um, so that sounds like, you know, on, on Shabbat itself, the calendar day. But if she made a vow before sunset, then he has only a few minutes to uh, undo the vow until Shabbat starts. After that, no, he can't do it any longer. So uh, in this, right, in this option, it's a calendar day. Um, so we see this is, according to this, it's a calendar day. We just said it's a 24-hour period. So now we have a problem. We have a contradiction. What are we going to do with this? Actually, there's two Tanaim as a machlok at Tanaim. And so, um, right, it's true that we have this that Rabbi Sheikh quoted, but we have another Tana, so we can follow the other Tana when we interpret um, our, our Mishnah and assume it's Me'at Le'ayat. One more point on this Mishnah, although it says sometimes it's stringent and sometimes it's lenient, it's not actually true, right? The, if, it's, if you say one day, that one day is uh, is always going to be could be the same or shorter than the 24-hour period, right? But the 24-hour period is always going to be the longer of the two, right? You never have a case where um, where the one calendar day is longer than 24 hours. So when it says here, it's really just saying that if you say a one-day period, it can be more or less. It's a variable time. Uh, okay, but never, never, can, never could be more than twenty-four hour period. Um, all right, and now the the uh, the, the last uh, section. Nishalim lindarim. I buy elu kishelo hayalo penai. Not the last section. How come the last? Um, and so when you say that you can undo a vow, is that when only when you didn't have a chance before Shabbat to do it? Or maybe even if you did have a chance, right? In other words, it makes a difference. But if you, if you had a chance to do it before Shabbat and you didn't do it before Shabbat, then you shouldn't be able to do it on Shabbat because you should have done it before. But do we say that or no? It doesn't matter. Well, there was a case where they did actually undo the vow, even though there was a time of chance to do it before. So you see, even if there was time to do it before, you can still do it on Shabbat. Um, in this case, there was a small alleyway between the two houses, and there was a, there was a corpse there in the alleyway. And there was a cracked roof on top of, the, between the two houses. And so that roof, if it's a, in fact, we have a picture here. It's a picture. Um, now, here, here's a picture. Um, so imagine here, if there's a dead body under this, right? And there you have a roof uh, up on top. Now, uh, a, a corpse is metame be'ohel, which means that all of the airspace that is covered by the roof also transmits the tumah. So if this is, has a big hole in it, then the tumah will go through and it's not an ohel. But if it's a small hole, then the tumah will go through, uh, will, will expand. And now, furthermore, there's a window in the house next door. Now, if you have an ohel, then it can also go through a window. Um, and then once it goes through the window, then it can spread throughout the house. 
So you see, they had this problem. So they did a couple of things. One, one is that they put something, they put a jug, they put an earthenware vessel in the window to stop it up, to close it up so that the tumah would not go in. And they also had to measure the hole that's on top here. So they took a piece of earthenware with a tie and they tied it up there to see how big the hole is. So they did all these things on Shabbat in order to determine the tumah or tahara status. So that's the that's the, um, the story that we're talking about. And they closed up the sealed up the window and they tied a shard uh, into the opening in the roof. To see if there is an opening of a hand breath or not. That's the story, and we bring the story because it's a precedent for this. We learn that you are allowed to do, you can't do any melacha just for a lucky purpose, but these things, since they're just about obdin in, uh, in the first place, so there we can be lenient in these cases. So you can seal a window, measure, and tie a knot. Okay, we end with a nice story. Um, here's a bathtub from Roman times. This is from Masada. Beautiful bathtub. Um, okay, so last saw that Eshkaluta, Eshkaluta, the exilarch, he's always a you know, rich, wealthy, important uh, person in charge of the Jews in Babel. And he saw that he's sitting in a tub of water and he's measuring it. He's measuring how big the water, how big the tub is. Wait, okay, you're allowed to do this as if it's a mitzvah. You're going to use this tub as a, as a mikveh, then it would be allowed. But you're not using it as a mikveh. This is just a, a tub. It's not connected to a, to a water source or a, a, you know, a rainwater or anything. So you're, I, I, I can tell you're measuring, but not for the purpose of a mitzvah. So why are you doing that? How are you allowed to do that? I'm It's I'm just, I'm just having fun, right? I'm just uh, uh, acting without any intention at all. So this is also kind of the opposite. If I have a purpose of a mitzvah, then it's allowed. If I have no purpose at all, and I'm just doing it, um, you know, just to pass the time, and I'm not actually measuring because I'm going to be building it, or I'm going to be cutting it, or I'm going to be drawing on it. It's not for any productive purpose. So therefore, it's uh, not really doing anything at all, and therefore it is permitted. Adran alach mishechshich u'selika la masechet shabbat. I'm going to read the special tefillah of Hadran Alach and completing a Masechet. Hadran Alach, Masechet Shabbat, Vadrach Alan, Vatach Alach, Masechet Shabbat, Vatach Alan, Nad Vishaminach, Masechet Shabbat, Vishaminach, the Mahamad Adin, the Mahamad Ate. He has some of the Nechad, the Nile Hendel Motel, she did what Hamad Motel, the Mazet, and Manu, the Maba, and Abba Bapa Papa, Nahman Bar Papa, Hai Bar Papa, Abba Mari Bar Papa, the Nabar Papa, the Fish Bar Papa. Thank you, everybody.